This conference will now be recorded. Our, our Wheeling University students. Father McCouch, will you please begin our discussion? This conference will now be recorded. Thank you, Phil. I'd like to begin with a prayer, uh, relying on the words of a letter that Bishop Hodges wrote to Bishop Begley while this letter was being composed. He said, remain mindful that our role is to build bridges. We place our conversation today under the intercession of St. Peter, who is the patron of bridges, that is to say, the first pontiff, the bridge between Christ and the church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Through God, in these days that need reconciliation and healing for our school, for our nation, and for our world, in these times that Pope Francis, our pontiff, calls us to hear the cries of our earth, to care for our common home, to be mindful of integrating ecology into action, to restore justice among us, we depend on your spirit, which helped bring the pastoral letter of 45 years ago into being. In the words of your servant, John Hodges, Remain mindful that our role is to build bridges between the oppressed and the oppressor, between the individual and the institution, between man and his creator, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. It is now my honor to introduce the president of Wheeling University, Jenny Favid, for her greetings from our university, President Favid. Your your mic is off, Jenny. <laughs> oh, it shows that I'm on. Am I? You're, you're good. Off? You're good now. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, allowing me to be a part of this. Thank you all to all of you for joining us today for the second discussion on this land is home to me. As uh, we've worked um, to set up today's program and and practiced uh, to ensure a smooth and error-free event, at the opportunity to listen to the message, the message of building bridges. Um, I, I believe that you all will, will recognize this is a much needed message um, in difficult times that, that we all need. Uh, as Pope Francis emphasized uh, in a recent blessing, uh, we have realized that we are all on the same boat. All of us are fragile and disoriented, but at the same time, important and needed. All of us are called to row together, each of us in need of comforting the other. Uh, in this difficult uh, pandemic that we are experiencing, uh, it is so important to be brought together um, with this lecture series um, by the 50 Year Club uh, and our Jesuit priests, Father Hadi and Father McHouch. So thank you to the 50 Year Club, Dr. Shahidi, Robbie D'Andrade, uh, Phil Ruchelelli for helping us to respond to our crisis with love and compassion and new ways of building those needed bridges Thank you for your ongoing and endless devotion and commitment to, to Wheeling Jesuit University and Wheeling University. Your commitment to continuing to live a life of purpose is much admired um, and appreciated. So thank you. Thank you, President Veed. You never cease to encourage us with your dynamic leadership. As director of the Appalachian Institute, Father McCouch provides continued Jesuit provincial connectivity to Wheeling Charleston Diocese and Wheeling University. It is in this area of expertise, he helps us understand this much heralded pastoral letter, This Land is Home to Me, which documents the Appalachian cry of the poor. Father McCouch. Thank you very much, Phil. I'd like to uh, also uh, thank my Jesuit brothers in supporting me, especially Father Jim O'Brien, who sent me a very kind note uh, this morning, and you know that's just like him. Uh, a few weeks ago, Father Hadi and I were out driving and we were admiring the uh, bridges across the Ohio River and noticing all the renovation and restoration that was going on. Father Hadi suggested to me at the time that this would be a good metaphor for how we introduced this second talk in light of how the uh, 
the pastoral letter, this land is home to me, acts as a bridge, uh, not only to our past, but also to Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, care for our common home. So I'd like to uh, move forward trying to understand how this land is home to me, and this home uh, acts as a bridge between past and the present uh, for the future. The key concepts that I'm going to be looking at during the course of this presentation, of course, include the gospel uh, as the key, uh, the key understanding of what it means uh, to be in relationship with God and neighbor. And out of the gospel develops the concept of social justice, and I'll show that. And from there to liberation theology, and from there to integral ecology and restorative justice. These terms may well, when you hear them, provoke a particular reaction. So for instance, when you hear the word gospel, you think in a certain way, you react in a certain way based on your experience of that word. In the same way, when you hear the words social justice, you understand them and react in a particular way. Some react to it in a conservative fashion, some in a liberal fashion, but there's a reaction nevertheless. The same in terms of a word like liberation theology. Liberation theology is really the basis, that, that concept is really the basis of how our letter comes to be written. But at the core of it are just these, these simple ideas. You see, you judge, you act. Pope Francis, a few years ago, in quoting Father General Arupe, said that it's impossible to talk about poverty without an experience of the poor. And that's what this idea of liberation theology is all about. We see, we judge, we act. This has a lot to do with how Jesuits teach. We talk about our Ignatian pedagogical paradigm. That is, we try and understand the whole context in which we are. We go into an experience with both feet. We reflect on that experience, and that leads us to action. Then we evaluate that action, and the cycle begins again. In preparing this presentation, I've depended a great deal on uh, one of our alumna's work, Alyssa Pasternak, now Alyssa Pasternak Post, who's the class of 2002, uh, wrote a thesis called Dare to Speak, which we, she published in 2011. So I'm going to depend on, on her for the structure of this uh, presentation. I'm going, of course, to talk about how this connects to the present uh, to Pope Francis and his idea of integral ecology. And I hope by the end of the talk to be able to introduce to you uh, another of your fellow alums, Jim Mock from the class of 1963, who is a human bridge between that time when the letter was written and these days. You know, in, in speaking about something that was written 45 years ago, maybe the best thing to begin with is to show all the various good things that have happened since then, which we can put into three categories. There were a number of official documents that resulted from this pastoral letter. There were a number of outreach ministries that began after this time. And there were a number of pastoral and action centers and prayer centers that all came into being in these times. I would like to emphasize one particular document because I, I think the influence of This Land is Home to Me was really crucial. In 1976, the U.S. bishops were writing a pastoral letter uh, called The Challenge of Peace. And one of the principal authors of that letter was Cardinal Bernadine, who at the time of This Land is Home to Me was Bishop of Cincinnati and therefore a signatory to This Land is Home to Me. He took the methodology and the message of This Land is Home to Me and expanded it from Appalachia to the whole nation. So I'd like to emphasize that these official documents of the church uh, have a kind of uh, fruit that they've borne since the time of the pastoral letter. In addition, certain outreach ministries have also begun. 
I'd like to emphasize the Mother Jones House, which was on our campus for a little while, as, as well as the uh, Pastoral Action and Prayer Centers. Now, our university has been related to a lot of these, along with a lot of other local partners and national partners. But we recognize something that the letter itself recognizes 45 years ago. They said at the start of the letter, we know that our words are not perfect. For that reason, this letter is but one part of an unfinished conversation with our people, with the truth of Appalachia, with the living God. Now, uh, in talking about this land is home to me as a bridge, maybe I should uh, make mention of how the letter came to be called, this land is home to me, a pastoral letter on powerlessness in Appalachia. It begins our story in a sense in 1973. Eight members of the Catholic community of Appalachia were attending a meeting of a larger group at Bethany College. And after that meeting, they went out to a coffee shop and they were talking about things they could do. And among those things, they decided that there should be or could be a pastoral letter on powerlessness in Appalachia. So that's, that's conceptually how the letter begins. And then they started talking to people, Bishop Hodges and others, about how this might be. The heading for the uh, name of the pastoral comes from a song that was written by Maureen Linneman, a Glen Mary sister at the time. She wrote a song called This Land is Home to Me. And that name of that song became the name of the pastoral letter. It's interesting, maybe a little ironic, that years later, much time after the pastoral letter was written, that Tom Briding, my assistant, wrote another song called This Land is Home to Me. So it's kind of a circle of inspiration. This letter uh, is a draft of uh, uh, the words of the bishops of Appalachia representing the entire region of Appalachia, all 13 states, which is a diverse population and at times an oppositional demographic. So we have to keep that in mind because the uh, writers of the pastoral letter uh, were walking a balance. They were writing for the bishops and you know the bishops themselves as bridges between the people and the larger community have to walk carefully. So I depend as I said on a list of past Pasternak's um, thesis, Dare to Speak, and I'm going to show you how uh, she builds a bridge. So on the foundations, we, we take a look at what gets included, what doesn't get included in this, uh, in this foundation. Of course, the gospel is the great foundation, the words uh, of Jesus. He says, go out to all the world and teach the good news. Well, what is that good news? Well, the good news is that God loves the poor. And I'll talk about how these terms came into being later and how uh, there is a preferential option for the poor that comes to us through social justice. It's developed through the words of the documents of Vatican II and then further developed through the ideas of liberation theology and by Pope Francis through integral ecology and restorative justice. Alicia Pasternak tells us that there are three contexts or three pylons on which our bridge is built, an historical context, a theological or ecclesial context, and a social context. That social context has to do with two things that were going on at the time. First, there was a letter called Justice in the World that had been written to which the bishops in Appalachia wished to respond. And also, they were preparing for, in 1975, what had been declared by Pope Paul VI, a holy year for reconciliation. So they knew that reconciliation was going to be the theme of this letter. The second context is ecclesial or theological about the church itself. It extends from the words of the Second Vatican Council, especially the emphasis in uh, the, the letter Gaudium et Spes on the laity as the people of God. Now, it also depends on another movement that's going on uh, in this country and around the world called the Catholic Worker Movement, 
which was very inspirational. You may know the work of folks like Dorothy Day and Peter Maurin, which was very important to the construction of the letter. The third context for our letter is the social context. You know, the Appalachian Regional uh, Conference had done a lot of work on defining politically what Appalachia was all about. So that was part of the social context. There was also, if you recall, if you stretch back to, to days when we were a little bit younger, uh, OPEC, the great oil crisis of 1973, and how that would have related to the emergence or re-emergence of coal as a very important resource for us in terms of energy. Also, the nation, our nation, was preparing for its bicentennial in 1976, and the ability to reconnect with the words of our founding fathers. Now, spanning that bridge for reconciliation, folks at the time were saying of the bishops that they had to be careful not to burn bridges, that things of the past were such that people could change their ways. The bishops were trying to represent not only the voice of the people, the popular voice, who were taking their cry for justice to the shepherds of the Catholic Church, but they were also trying to uh, express their own voice as bishops, as pontiffs. Some people said that their voice was skillful and diplomatic. Other people accused the bishops of having a double standard, that is, one way of listening to the voice of the common people, another way of listening to a third group, that is, the voice of leaders of industry. The leaders of industry had some very important and basic concerns about the letter, especially because they said uh, that the church and many others had benefited from the work of industry. Do we really want, Bishop Hodges said, do we really want our letter to be an attack on the free enterprise system? Do we want our letter to be an attack on liberal economics? So that was part of the challenge and why the bishops were accused of maybe having a double standard. With the people of God, so to speak, there were surveys sent out to all the parishes, there were focus groups, there were thousands, thousands of people consulted. And on the other hand, there was also a meeting where the bishops, certain bishops met with certain industrial leaders, and it seemed that they were not quite equivalent in terms of their influence. However, the results of the letter, as they were negotiating these various uh, challenges, the results were that official documents were uh, put out, outreach ministries were uh, built, and these action and pastoral and prayer centers were opened all around West Virginia and Appalachia. We're most familiar with the ones in West Virginia, of course. Now, we know, too, that there were certain things that were rejected in the construction of the letter. And we'll talk about the language first. The very preliminary draft was very churchy uh, in its language. And the response of the original writers of the team was basically just to throw it out and start over again and to use a language that was more poetic. I mentioned the influence of the Catholic worker, especially the writing of Peter Maurin. And that poetic style of, of writing came to be the style which was adopted for the letter. Now, of course, the, the challenge of this kind of epic writing is though it's very expressive, it could also cause some confusion or painting with a broad brush. So it eventually it was decided to use this epic and uh, biblical language in uh, the presentation of the letter, and that works its way through the next three drafts. By the time we got to the third draft, they had started talking, too, about contributions to Appalachia, and one controversial figure uh, was highlighted, that of uh, someone we know today as Mother Jones. Mother Jones was a bit of a firebrand in the region. She said, we should be praying for those who have died but we should be raising hell for those who are living. Some thought that she was not the ideal model uh, for the letter that we should consider the model, for instance, of 
the, uh, the Blessed Mother, Mary, um, as, as uh, a more ideal model. The other thing that was rejected were uh, languages about forces, and I put that in quotations, certain forces of destruction. Uh, and this was reflected in both the language of the pastoral letter and also the artwork that was to accompany it. These were ultimately rejected after much discussion because in the words of Bishop Hodges, in order to use this kind of language, you have to be able to uh, justify by documenting these kinds of words. You've got to document the people you're accusing. You've got to document the companies you're accusing. And of course, at that time, such document, documentation was a little bit rare. So uh, we know, and the bishops acknowledge this in the letter, and they write, we know that there will be other opinions about the truth of Appalachia. And that goes back to what they said at the start of the letter, that this is an incomplete dialogue. Now, I want to, in order to put our letter in a broader context, to look at uh, what Pope Francis is saying today, but what other pontiffs said long ago. Today, Pope Francis will say, this is our plan for life. Make bridges, make human bridges, really important. I'm going to go all the way back 250 years ago to two very important popes who influenced the way in which our conversation gets oriented. And here's, here's uh, some words. So Clement the 13th in the year 1758, he writes, among the fruits of justice, mercy to the poor should certainly be considered the most important. That justice which comes from faith belongs to Jesus Christ. The poor require our generosity as their principal right. Now, I mention this because the work of the Jesuits at the time was stirring things up all around Europe and uh, North and South America. And in fact, the um, uh, successor to Clement the 13th, who was Clement the 14th, found or discovered or decided that the Jesuits who were teaching at the time were stirring up so much trouble that it was a threat to world peace. And so he released a letter called Dominus Ac Redemptor, which talks about the Prince of Peace, that Jesus is all about reconciliation and Jesuits were getting in the way. So what does he do? He suppresses uh, the Jesuit order. Now, part of this suppression was accompanying a whole lot of social instability that was going on at the time of the French Revolution that started to calm down by 1815 and the Congress of Vienna and the inception of or the acceptance of certain liberal ideas. At that time too, the Jesuit order was reestablished uh, or reaffirmed. And one of the first uh, young men to join that order when it was reestablished was a man by the name of Luigi Tapparelli, who went on to become a great teacher in Sicily. And he is the one who first uses the words social justice. He writes in 1843, if an individual receives so much from another to whose goods he had no previous right, he must give as much in return if he wishes to settle accounts according to justice. So you can see there the precursor to the ideas of social justice that are behind the pastoral letter, this land is home to me. Now I'll mention that at the same time in the United States, the Jesuits were meeting with the Bishop of uh, Wheeling, the, the man who would be the first Bishop of Wheeling, uh, Bishop Whalen, under the influence of a very important layman. And I don't want to, uh, I don't want to uh, underemphasize the work of a layman called Henry Moore. He arranged for this meeting and later on the consultors of the provincial met with him and they communicated uh, uh, that was communicated to them, a wish expressed by Mr. Moore and Bishop Whalen, that the society should build a college here 
in Wheeling, West, in Wheeling, Virginia. At the time, it was still Virginia. Now, that's what was going on in the US, uh, in Europe. There are three very important students of Luigi Taparelli. One, Giacchino Pecci, who goes on to become Pope Leo XIII. Another by the name of Matteo Liberatori. The two of them, Pecci and Liberatori, go on to write the very first encyclical about justice called Rerum Navarum in 1891. And I want to mention one of Liberatori's students by the name of Oswald von Melbruning, who 40 years later, on the anniversary of Rerum Navarum, writes a letter called Quadragesimo Anno on the 40th anniversary of Rerum Navarum. This letter emphasizing social justice was so important because at that point in 1931, it becomes the official teaching of the Catholic Church. Also in 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt running for president quotes Quadragesimo Anno and says it's one of the greatest expressions and one of the greatest letters written in modern times. And he uses it to run on his presidential platform in 1932. So we've come a long way. I don't want to forget that uh, during this same time, Henry Moore is still at work uh, encouraging the bishop with the visitation sisters, with the sisters of St. Joseph. Um, in getting our first Jesuit into West Virginia, a, a, a priest by the name of Roger Dietz, and also with a man by the name of Charles Ellett, who was the designer of the Great Suspension Bridge. That brings us to how uh, the international world and the world of Wheeling, West Virginia come together. So at the time that Vatican II is being planned, Wheeling College is opening in 1952. Vatican II goes on to express itself in its letters and the various pontiffs since then expressing their ideas about social justice. So that uh, these, these two worlds are bridged together uh, by this very important landmark letter, this land is home to me. Now I mentioned uh, that 45 years ago, this uh, was written as an expression that became the foundation of many other documents, many outreach ministries, and uh, many pastoral centers, many action centers, many prayer centers. But in these days, 45 years later, our society faces many, many problems, challenges that are social, that are economic, that are political, that are related to health. We can name just a few of them, Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, the clerical abuse crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, the possibility of uh, recession, uh, the number of colleges that have been closing since, uh, 19, uh, uh, since uh, 2016. So we don't want to ignore what's going on around us socially. And we know that this impinges on on how we respond today. Pope Francis, speaking back in uh, the year 2013 to some students, he says, I would like to say this to educators, to those who work in schools, to parents. Educating, in educating, a balance must be maintained. Your steps must be well balanced. One step on the cornice of safety, but the other into the zone of risk. That is to say one step, one, one foot on the roof and one step into what is unknown. He says, when the risk becomes safe, the next step must venture into another area of risk. Education cannot be confined to the safety zone. No, this, this, uh, this would prevent us from developing. It's not possible to educate solely in the risk zone Either though, he says, this is dangerous. So it's a balance of steps that he calls us to. Now, uh, in this regard then, we have a lot of contemporary challenges, but we also have these contemporary bridges. Pope Francis says, by way of summary, he says, we're faced not with two separate crises, one that's environmental and one that's social, 
but rather with a complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. And I would add that, of course, it's political as well, and it involves our health and the economy. Pope Francis says that strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, to restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature in the world around us. So that in summary, we see that there are three kinds of bridges. There are the kind of bridge that are the people of action and the work that they do. We have as a bridge the documents of that work in action that Bishop Hodges forcefully called for. He said, you've got to document what's going on. And third, of course, the results that we see both in the opportunities that we share and with the challenges that we face. Pope Francis in his recent letters, Laudato Si and uh, Carita Amazonia, speaks about the idea of uh, integral ecology, how we have to uh, think of what's going on in the world as a unified whole, that it's not just a matter of justice for people, it's a matter of justice for the work of God's creation as well, justice for uh, the earth. I want to mention before I, before I finish uh, that I had a great conversation recently with Mr. Jim Mock, the class of 1963. He had uh, listened to our last conversation and we talked about his work back in the 1970s as director of Catholic Charities of the time. And if he's listening today, I hope he will, in our discussion portion, uh, introduce himself and talk a little bit uh, about his work. So this completes uh, my discussion. And so, Phil, I invite you to uh, get back on here and then uh, introduce Father Hadi for uh, his reflection. Thank you, Father McCouch, this, for this enlightening historical and connective analysis of the pastoral letter, church thinking, relation and relations to the current social uh, issues and needs. Father Ignatius Sazmita, better known to Wheeling University students as Father Hadi, serves as campus minister, promoting intercultural and interfaith opportunities for our students. He will now provide a response to Father McCouch's presentation. Father Hadi. Thank you, um, Father Rich, and thank you, Phil. So in preparation uh, of the first session, at that time, we did not yet know uh, Mr. Jim Mock, who is considered as a primary source in the history of this pastoral letter. He was uh, working at the Catholic Charities in the preparation and publication of the pastoral letter back then. However, at that time, uh, we had a secondary source from Alyssa Pasternak Post thesis. Uh, Alyssa did, the, did not know Jim Mock when she was doing her research and writing the thesis because Jim was living in other parts of the country. It is consoling for us to confirm that uh, what Alyssa included in the thesis with uh, how it matches with Jim's explanation to Father Rich. So there is a bridge between the primary and secondary sources to the his same historical uh, reality. For example, is the explanation about the exclusion of Mother Jones and also the concern about meeting of bishops with industrial leaders in Pittsburgh uh, sometime before the publication of the pastoral letter itself. A bridge that Father Rich tries to construct connects between the particularity of this land is home to me with the universality of Pope Francis encyclical Laudato Si. It shows that the local concern in Appalachia does not stand alone, but rather is interconnected with concerns of the universal church. We have seen bridges across historical moments. We have seen bridges across particular and universal concerns. Now I want to invite all of you, all of us here, to consider personal bridges to connect with something greater than oneself. Part of the Jesuit education is to recognize uh, something that is greater than oneself. So here are some questions or tools 
to build one's own personal bridges. Which part of this land is home to me inspire you and ignite your imagination and why? Which parts of Laudato Si inspire you and ignite your imagination and why? Do any of those parts inspire you to take any action or change in lifestyle? What actions or changes in lifestyle do you hope to take? Are there any parts from the pastoral letter or encyclical that you want to promote in your own family or community or organization? Which parts do you want to promote and how? I just want to give you uh, my personal example of that uh, personal bridge. Uh, since I read the Laudato C, one of the basic things I learned is about the habit of recycling. Uh, so whenever I began going to sh grocery shopping, I stopped using uh, the plastic bag and began to carry the bags. It's uh, a bag of my own. That way to reduce the use of plastics. And at the same time on campus, as Appalachia Institute continues to try to promote the habit of recycling, I continue to support uh, Father Rich and the Appalachia Institute in that project. Now, Laudato Si in the encyclical, Pope Francis recognized that not every one of us has big power. Uh, many of us cannot influence the policy or industry in a way that have an impact on environment, on our ecological concern. However, he does encourage each one of us personally, each person to do our small parts, because by doing our small parts, by doing our little bridge, we can continue to have an impact in a big way on our ecological concerns. So why personal bridge? As Christians, we believe in incarnation as God's way of bridging divinity with humanity through the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. So the particular wisdom of Appalachia and the universal wisdom of Laudato Si need to be expressed in one's personal and communal life. The incarnation of these Christian values needs to take place in one's own life, not just as words in pastoral or encyclical letters. Those words become flesh and blood in our own life. Thank you. Thank you, Father, says Father Hadi, for these, uh, for your response and, and personal challenges. Before opening our alumni, for our alumni questions and comments, possibly uh, President Jenny would like to reflect on the presentations. President Favid. Thank you. Thank you, Father Hadi. Thank you, Father McCouch, uh, for leading us through today's discussions. Uh, I think more importantly, for bringing us back to the work that we are all called to do, reminding us of, of our Appalachian roots and of the need that the Appalachian region still has. Um, for all of you, it's my privilege to share Father Hadi uh, and Father McCouch with you today. Um, I recognize um, and understand the need that you have uh, for them to remain part of your daily lives, especially in these difficult times. So I appreciate uh, the ability to do this. Um, but Father Hadi, Father McCouch, um, I, I, as I, as I mentioned earlier, I think the message has been resonated because we've been working on this this week, um, the need to build bridges. Um, and, and I think that's a, a mantra that we need to, to practice, that we need to build bridges and, and be a bridge, be human bridges um, in all aspects of our lives um, and, and hold one another's hands through, through the difficult times, but through the good times as well. Um, so. Today, I am reminded that although many things have been canceled because of the coronavirus, um, I sit here today and I realize that um, among all of the things that have been canceled, love is not one of them. So I appreciate your presence um, and your commitment to sharing our, our faith today. So thank you. Thank you, President Favid. Uh, we will now uh, like to open our mics and hear from our alumni who have joined us this afternoon. We ask that if you uh, wish to be recognized, either raise your hand 
uh, so we can recognize you or uh, send your question uh, in a message on the chat board. Uh, also, when asking a question, please state your name and your class, if you would, please. So if we could uh, open, the, open the mics, open our uh, uh, mics up to uh, those that are viewing, we'd appreciate that. We have any questions? Comments? Silence. <laughs> Anyone out there want to comment or uh, do we have anything in the uh, chat box there? No, how do you raise your hand? Uh, just uh, raise it right here if you're if we can see you. I, uh, some people we can't see. I can't see, uh, but uh, if they're in the chat box there, we should be able to. Uh... Okay, if you if you just want to unlock your mic and uh, and say something, just go ahead. Just identify yourself. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, this is Ed Buckley. I'm from several classes, 65 and 71. I took my time. Um, one of the things I find listening to this is bridges are, in my opinion, very easy to pay attention in our day to day lives. There are people today who, when you go to the store, are troubled by being locked up. There are kids who are, I work as a guardian ad litem, there are kids who have effectively no parents, none. Their parents did their termination of parental rights. Um, they have no family, they no have any, they have no one. And it reinforces to me it is that we can help other people. It's not a difficult thing to do. I don't think it's anything formal. I don't think it's anything um, time. It's a daily, daily thing. You know, back to the uh, let your light shine. Everyone here, and while we don't necessarily remember each other, I do remember a lot of the names that we hear. Martha Shields woman, who is my sister, but and David, but there's so much that we can do. And I find it, I guess, troubling to a degree that we have to reinforce it through these, uh, and I love this, by the way. I think it's very worthwhile to remember a lot of things. Um, I think it's great. I truly do. Um, and rather than just, you know, go on and on, I think each one of us has the opportunity on a daily basis to help other people and build bridges in our community, uh, whether you be in the Knights of Columbus or whether you be a guardian ad litem or whether you're in NAACP, I don't care what it is. And it's not just joining, it's participating in what's going on around us. Uh, you just can't come in the house, close the door, put your feet up and say, I'm done with the day. You have to look out and say, how can I, how can I do things to help other people and build bridges that can help other people and help communities. A lot of communities are really hurting right now. So I'll be shutting up now, but it could only be temporary. Uh, but I just wanted to make those comments. I, I really enjoyed this, and it reinforces to me that I have to be aware of what's going on out there, whether it be Pope Francis, whether it be, you know, Father Hattie, whether it be whomever it might be. Uh, I, I can help the world. All I have to do is reach out. I'll be shutting up now, as I said before.
Thank, thank you, Ann. thank you. Certainly, uh, certainly, Ed, uh, that's it's great because that's just what we were talking about being a bridge, and I'm sure that many of our our classmates are are bridges. Is there anyone else that'd like to uh, comment or ask a question of Father McCouch or Father Hadi? I have a question. Yes. John Bosco, class of '62. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. In light of these presentations, which I really enjoy, I'm wondering if the university has asked the local bishop how he sees this land as home to me, the web, it, home in the web of life, and particularly the statements of Pope Francis. Because if, I'm sure you're aware there's a lot of opposition to not only his letter on the environment, but more his letter on the Amazon. So I, I think just be curious if the college, if the university has uh, talked to him about it or about the presentation or anything like that, just to see where he stands on it. Not that he has to give permission, but just see where he stands on it. So can I answer that, please? Yes. I wanted to share um, that the um, the 50 year club had actually asked um, if I would invite uh, Bishop Brennan to participate um, and as part of the lecture series. And um, after our meeting uh, the day before yesterday, um, Father McCouch came um, with me to my office and I invited him. Bishop Brennan was actually physically here yesterday as we're having the baccalaureate mass and commencement this weekend. And I asked Father McCouch to join um, me um, so that he would have an opportunity to ask him himself. Um, and, and Father McCouch, would you like to share with, with um, the group the bishop's response? Sure. Um, on our way to the field to look over uh, the area for uh, the baccalaureate, uh, I, I talked to uh, uh, the bishop about a couple of things. One, that he's very willing to participate, so we have to uh, arrange that for one of our next times, so he's willing to participate. Secondly, he informed me that he was in conversation with the Catholic uh, community of Appalachia at a meeting last week, and we talked about their exchanges and uh, he addressed specifically, one of his, his major concerns was, uh, if you re remember the, the gospel from this past Sunday, uh, where the sower goes out to sow and some weeds are there, and the idea of how you can't always pull up all the weeds without pulling up the good things as well, and how that is sometimes a matter of concern when you're trying to do good, when you're trying to eliminate evil, but when they're simultaneous, how you how you have to work really hard for that balance. That was true 45 years ago. I think Bishop Brennan is finding it true as well today. So I think he's very eager to be part of this conversation. And I think it, it will just be a matter of scheduling and, and finding a way in which to integrate our conversation, but not to neglect that we have to talk about how sustainable our gains over the past you know 50 60 years how those uh gains are sustainable because not everything begun is sustainable and we have to talk we have to talk about that thank you so do, do i notice did did i see that jim mock had joined our conversation he did oh Jim, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work and the conversation we had? Jim, turn on your uh, your uh, turn your mic. mic on, Jim. Yeah, little red button, just make it there green. It is. There, there you go. go. Um, um, yes, I am uh, uh, retired. I was uh, director of Catholic Charities uh, for the diocese uh, from nineteen. Uh, 56 uh, through uh, 1972, I think it was. I'd have to go back and look again. Um, and um, our responsibility was uh, services throughout the uh, 
uh, archdiocese for providing social services. We had a staff of, uh, of four people. Uh, we also covered 17 counties of Virginia at that time, uh, as that was part of our diocese. Um, my involvement with uh, this project in terms of uh, uh, the pastoral um, was that uh, one of my staff who was responsible for community development, community development projects, uh, John Klug, came and suggested that maybe in view of the problems within the state of West Virginia, uh, we take a look at uh, what was being done um, in, in some of the other dioceses. Um, and so uh, we went in particularly what was being done in South America um, in terms of the bishops taking stance. And so we did that and uh, presented it to the archbishop or to the bishop at that time. And he in turn uh, thought it was a good idea, but wanted to test it first uh, with his fellow bishops. And that's kind of how the project really got started. Jim, thank you very much for adding that. As Father Hadi was saying, your words today are a bridge. They help verify uh, the history of these 45 years. And it's, I think it helps indicate too how important alumni are to the whole process uh, of thinking, reflecting, acting. I, I would add a person, personal note. Uh, I spent my entire, uh, I was born in Appalachia, basically, uh, right in, in uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, which is all part of Appalachia. I uh, grew up there uh, across the river in Ohio um, and ended up graduating from uh, Wheeling Jesuit. Uh, it was the fifth graduating class. Um, it was uh, purely by the uh, grace of God and the uh, encouragement of my mother that I got a degree um, and went on from there. Um, we were, uh, our family had many of the characteristics of uh, Appalachia. Uh, my father died at 42 with a heart attack uh, in uh, emphysema. Uh, my grandfather died um, of, uh, of uh, lung issues. And uh, my wife's uh, father spent 40 years underground in the mine and ended up with black lung. Um, so we're really, um, what was happening throughout throughout that whole region. Um, one of the significant uh, statistics was in uh, 1950, uh, Belmont County and uh, Ohio County, West Virginia and Ohio, had over 17,000 men employed in the mines. And by 1960, that had been reduced to 4,000 men in the mines. And it had been reduced by uh, a, a mining process with the joy, what they called a joy loader, which was able to go into the mines and, and, and cut the walls quicker. Um, and that had a severe impact on the entire uh, 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 counties, uh, the economies in those counties. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we were affected uh, throughout our lives as, as children and as adults on uh, the, the negative aspects of uh, coal mining and steel mill, for that matter. That kind of gives you a little bit of background. So we were, you know, we were, John and I were very interested in, in the archbishop or in the bishop doing something. Um, uh, I came then later, 10 years later, I came to Colorado and took over the directorship of Catholic Charities and did that for uh, almost 30 years. Uh, it was a completely different operation. Jim, thank you. One of the things that we mentioned in our phone conversation was that your experience has never been archived. And so I want to be sure that uh, at a future date that you and I and perhaps Alicia uh, Pasternak and maybe Sister Gretchen, who is still with us, uh, can sit down and archive your experience uh, 
uh, as part of our university archive as well. Well, thank you. I'd be honored. Bill, uh, thank you. Dan thank Heller. You. Yes, go ahead. Uh, it would be nice if people knew how to access um, uh, these materials. Um, uh, Pastor Nax, uh, thesis, I know it's a long one, but just be able to read it. And also uh, uh, the uh, bishop's letter, this, this land is home to me. Yes, we, what we're gonna do is uh, document these uh, record, we're gonna record what, what's happened today, but we will also document the links uh, to those uh, to those materials. Uh, myself, I went online and actually actually purchased hard copy, and you can get it. I think it was only like nine dollars, and it has the uh, this home to me and uh, at home in the web life, and it's a very good. And it also has all the signatories to the letter, which uh, gives you some background on the letter. But uh, you can also find it online uh, with a link. So uh, we'll get those links for you all as we continue our series. I just, uh, I think we're coming up on time now. Is there anyone else that would like to comment uh, before uh, we move on? Oh, great. Well, uh, we, uh, we wanna thank you. Go ahead, uh, Jenny. I I just wanted to add something else um, in regards to Bishop Brennan um, and his um, attending a, a meeting here yesterday. As you all know, um, the, the, the campus itself is under construction and we are working hard, uh, improving it every day. Um, but a paving of the entryway was taking place this week. And so the, the front entrance to the university is, is gated, shut down, and we've been coming through the back gate. Uh, well, Bishop Brennan wasn't, uh, isn't from here, isn't real familiar with the area, and didn't know this. And um, Father Hottie, Father McCouch, and I, and um, a few folks were waiting for him in the chapel, and, and he was a few minutes late, and, and we became a little concerned. Um, but I want to share this with you. Not because, it's not trivial. I think it speaks to the man that Bishop Brennan is. Um, he parked on the street on Washington Avenue um, because he didn't know to put out um, hole and run, and he walked um, up to the chapel. Um, he came alone. He drives himself. He takes all the time in the world. Um, anything that he does here on this for this university, with this university, um, for our students, he personally um, wrote a letter um, to every single one of our graduating seniors this year. He called me um, about a month and a half ago and asked if, if, if I thought that would be an acceptable um, idea. Um, and, and I share that with you because I know that we've gone through a difficult time here at the university um, and we've had a change of, of, of bishops. Um, but I think Father Hottie and Father McCouch will tell you, uh, Bishop Brennan is, is a very special individual and we are blessed to have him as part of our diocese, to have him as part of this university. And, and I do hope um, that there comes a time very soon that you all have an opportunity to meet him and, and get to know him yourself. But I, I found that to be very sweet yesterday. Um, and, and it was 97 degrees, wasn't it, Father Hottie, Father McCouch? Um, and he walked with us down to the football field and, and he made sure that he knew exactly um, what was going to transpire uh, for baccalaureate math. So I just wanted to share that a little bit about him with you all. Thank you. One, of, one of the things that I, I should point out and share regarding uh, Bishop Hodges, um, when we went to Bishop Hodges with the idea and he uh, willingly uh, picked up on it and uh, said that he would do it if the other diocese uh, would join in because of the whole area. He wanted it to be a unified approach. In the process, um, when the document was uh, first brought up for review, uh, Bishop Hodges said he wanted the coal companies to also have a look at what was being written and sent a copy of it to the headquarters, which was in Pittsburgh of one of the major coal companies. I can't remember which one. Um, Subsequent, uh, two of the, uh, one of the one of the marketing PR people and one of the vice presidents of the 
uh, Coke Company visited with uh, with the bishop um, and uh, object, objected to the document and said that if in fact he did he released this document they would do everything they could in their power to discredit him and anyone that was associated with the diocese. Um, Bishop Hodges uh, called John and I over and said, I want you to go through this document one more time and see if there is anything we cannot substantiate. We went back and said, we've reviewed it and think it's all right. He said, there, there is one issue that I do think we ought to uh, address. And that was the reference to Mother Jones uh, in, in Fairmont was where she was working at that time um, or had worked. And uh, he said, you know, uh, they say she was Catholic, but um, I don't think she was all that Catholic. And I think we ought at least not uh, delete the what, what was made uh, in the document but delete any reference to Mother Jones as being one of our key leaders in this whole process. And we found that humorous and said, well, fine, if that's the only objection he has, uh, he published it and he, he then, then went ahead and said, signed off on it. And uh, the coal company, to my knowledge, I left about a year later, uh, to my knowledge, the coal company never did approach him. And I had, future visits with, with the bishop when I'd go back home. Um, and um, it never did bring a subject up. So anyhow, I think that's an important little tidbit. Thank, thank you, Jim. That, uh, and, and it uh, attests to the need to archive as, as Father McCouch has, uh, has stated. I know that uh, I know that uh, if you have any more questions or information, uh, Father McCouch and uh, Father Hadi uh, are open to receive your emails and communicate with you. Uh, my own communication over the past 52 years until a few years ago was with uh, my dear uh, friend, uh, Father Joe Sanders. And I know that each and every one of the alumni has a special uh, place in their heart, the Jesuits, and it's in a special, probably a special Jesuit that they that they have uh, that they have ministered with in during their lives. So, so please please open open your emails and, and communicate with these two wonderful uh, two wonderful priests. I now want to turn over to Ed Shahidi for a few uh, comments and regarding support for for our university. Ed. Uh, thank you, and thank everybody for being here. I'll be very brief. What I want to say is in the slide. I see who's on there, and the great majority of you are donators. Of you, I ask, will you consider an additional donation? For those of you that haven't donated, please donate. The, it's a tremendous challenge for our president and the rest of the university during these difficult times. And your contributions are extremely appreciated. Thanks again for being on, and I return it to you, Bill. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ed. Father Hadi, will you please lead us in a closing prayer? Yeah, I'm going to use uh, some words of uh, Pope Francis as a closing prayer. So let us uh, bow our head, asking for God's blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He builds bridges, whereas hatred is the builder of walls. You must decide in life. Either I will make bridges, or I will make bridges. When you shake the hands of a friend, of a person, you make a human bridge. You make a bridge. This is what we must do, make bridges. Do not fall to the ground. Do not say, oh, I can't. No, always look for a way of building bridges. You are there with your hands. Make bridges, all of you. Take each other by the hand. I want to see lots of human bridges. This is the plan for life. Make bridges, 
human bridges. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. As we end this second lecture of our series, we request that you complete the evaluation that will be provided in order that we may improve these presentations. And finally, please invite friends and fellow alumni to join us Thursday, August 20th at noon for the third lec series, uh, the third lecture in our series, This Land is Home to Me. Again, thank you all for your participation and enthusiastic response to this Wheeling University 50-Year Club initiative. See you all next month. Thank you, Phil.